Hello YouTube. Uh, this is Ivan again. I wanted to do a video of a of a recent object that I reprocessed. The data is uh, from last year because it's been raining here and nonstop, and I haven't had time to do any kind of imaging. So I wanted to kind of go through uh, my progression over imaging this object over maybe three years. Um, shot with different telescopes, uh, smaller, bigger and processed differently. The reason I'm shooting the video today is um, I reprocessed the image a couple of days ago. Um, I sent it over to the folks at uh, APOD, uh, Jerry and Robert, and they published this as a notable image, not necessarily an APOD yet, but that's still a big distinction and I'm really proud of it. So I wanted to share that with everybody and kind of show you guys how I progressed throughout my North American nebula uh, image. This is NGC 7000 or the North American Nebula. It's a very big object in the night sky. It's relatively bright in hydrogen and oxygen. There is some sulfur there, but um, mostly it's a massive uh, remnant of a supernova. Um, and it's also located close to the Pelican Nebula, which is again, a, a beautiful nebula to, to shoot. This is uh, imaged with my Ultra, uh, my Officina Stellari Ultra RC. The Paramount, the QH Y six hundred, because it's the best camera I own. I have two of those, and I cannot say enough good things about the QH Y company and the cameras they make. Specifically in the environment that we're in today, where some of the big time players that made uh, CCDs are 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 either no longer in uh, the market or they still sell old technology. So QH Y is a pretty good solution for a lot of us who don't want to use CCDs anymore. Um, so today we're going to look at the equipment quickly, some past images, and then get through the processing and see what we have. So let's go over to VixInsight, the telescope. I've shown this a couple of times. It's been on my table as recently as last week. It's a pretty heavy telescope, so I decided not to lift it again. It's a trust tube. It's f5.4. This configuration I was using a ZW6200, but I don't really have any good images that I shot with that setup. So I'm going to show it with this, the QHY600 Pro, which is what I use now. Better cooling, better read modes, um, bigger memory, better sensor. Uh, one quick note to everybody who discusses the differences between ZW6200 and the QHY600. Know this, this chip is not on a it's not an industrial chip so it will die a lot faster plus the architecture and the way it's put in place it's much much inferior to what qhy does qhy had some problems with the 367 back um where their chips were were kind of failing due to the way they were mounted they fixed that they have better connections better um architecture when it comes to the um uh, the PCBs and everything. Plus, they have a service center in America. So if you have a problem with the camera, you'll send it to somebody and you'll get one within two weeks. I've, I've done that twice and they've always been great. So the setup is this, the telescope, the computer, a saddle three inch focuser, which is here. ZW-174 Mini, they're great guiding cameras. As long as you don't have to image with them, as long as you're just literally using them for guiding, ZWs are good cameras uh, until they break. So I'll leave it at that. Now, uh, I also use a dew shield, and I said why a few times. Humidity is pretty high in my uh, Bay Area location, and not far from the Pacific Ocean. There's the bay also here. Uh, plenty of humidity, especially during um, autumn and spring. So I need to kind of make sure that I don't get any dew and the telescope isn't full of water. Um, I'm shooting flats here with the Optic flat panel, an incredible little device, uh, also made in the US, very high quality. Those guys make some of the most, the best focusers around, but I only have their flat panel. Um, so this is standing on the Paramount ME1. It is a legendary mount. If you can find one used, they're, they're really, really good for the quality, the BISC, software BISC, company has been around doing this for a long time and they have some of the best equatorial mounts you can find now yes they're newer harmonic mounts that are better but better on paper not necessarily in reality because they have their own issues periodic error correction and other stuff so this is the equipment um let's take a look at past images now i have a couple here let's start with this this is taken with a 
Takahashi FSQ 106N, which is the precursor to the ED. Um, the difference is it has the fluoride element outside versus uh, in on the um, ED, and it doesn't support the reducer. Now, it's not a bad telescope. The focus on, on the version I had was destroyed. The owner literally put another focus at the back. That's how bad it was. Um, star size is uh, it's actually bigger than um, the RH200. Um, as you get closer to the edge of the frame, as you can see some of these stars, they have weird artifacts. It's a great telescope, but it's not as fast as the RH200. It is easier to balance, rather easy to use if you get a good focuser. And the only option I had was a Feather Touch 3.5 inches. An incredible focuser, but by that point, you're almost left only with the objective from Takahashi. So this is a mosaic, a two panel image taken with the Takahashi FSQ 106 and the Moravian 16200. Now this is a scaled down version. Um, you can find an Astro bin. It's actually a pretty decent image. I think there was about 40 hours in here. Being a CCD, it's predictable, easy to calibrate, but not as sensitive. So this was one of my, um, I think I took this two years ago and I'm actually pretty happy with it. There's enough nebulosity, the colors look good, the oxygen, and the dark nebulosity has been pulled in, really happy. This one is a little bit older, but at the time I was over the moon with this image. This is taken with the old GSO, um, trust tube, uh, the 12 inch. Um, it is, I believe, about 20 hours of exposure. Usually I did about six or seven hours per channel. Um, my processing skills were the best. As you can see, my stars are pretty yellow. Uh, I believe I wasn't even looking at the star size when I was stacking images. I wasn't checking full width half maximum and a bunch of other stuff. So, and I wasn't removing the stars. As you can see, this star is massive, oversaturated and also kind of wobbly. Uh, probably my collimation or tilt wasn't the best. Um, this was also taken with the Moravian 16200 MK1 camera. Excellent CCD, uh, but not as sensitive and not as high resolution as the ZWO near model. Oh, this image actually is the same data that I'm going to show you today, but it's a mosaic. So the image that I processed recently is just the right hand side. I will process the left and join them. Uh, this is the mosaic that's actually printed behind me uh, on a big th uh, 30 by 60 inch um, acrylic face mounted metallic print. It's amazing. Everybody who's seen it at the galleries loves it. It's pretty incredible. Um, and it's a limited series. I'll only make two and then I'm done. Uh, the copyright stuff is from Astropin because <laughs> it's just easier to get the images from there. Uh, my images from there. So this is the image. This is my first iteration of it. Now, I had issues with my um, secondary baffle, the extra one that created those weird uh, kind of water droplets in the stars where it diffused the light and created this weird concentric circles. I'm still happy with the image. This is a SHO with my modified color scheme. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, it's it's a good image. Um, again, I've printed it. I've have had it, I've had it for a while. Naturally, it didn't win any Astro Ben images topic or anything because it's not uh, taken with a one meter telescope in the desert. But I was still really happy with it. But with advancements in the way we process, with my new workflow, and just just to, for the heck of it, I decided to reprocess it. So let's look at the data that I started with. This is the same data I had before. Oxygen looks good. The dark nebulosity, again, oxygen almost looks like an inverted version of the HA. Everything looked good. Again, the issue with the stars that I was describing will be more evident if I zoom into this star. As you can see, there's weird concentric circles that diffuse the light and created this weird uh, problem. Now, as the, the, the bigger the stars, the more obvious this is. And as I, if I go down to some of these stars here, it's going to be even clearer. Uh, excuse me. So this telescope at the time wasn't perfect. Um, it had these weird things, so I was the way I was processing, I was really, really limited to getting uh, better images than I thought. The sulfur looks really good. Now, the Florida panhandle is pretty defined. You can see even these kind of uh, little islands of nebulosity look good. Um, it flat-fielded really well. 
Um, I think there were some issues with tilt in some corners, but I'm not going to worry about that for now. HA looks a little bit dimmed out. I think um, it needed a little bit of a background, dynamic background extraction or something. Uh, the data is good. If I push it a little bit more, you can see it's pretty good. But um, again, from my, from my point of view, I look at the noise levels. I look at how um, flat the image is across the field, so there's no weird gradients. But again, my friend, the concentric star, was there, and this was probably the bane of my existence with this telescope for a while until I had it fixed. So this is the raw data. It looks good. It looks workable. I'm sure there's going to be some stuff I have to fix because of these stars. Let's look at the uh, second steps. So what I did is I did I used the blood exterminator on the linear image after I stacked it. This is a I used hydrogen as the luminous layer, so it's a hydrogen sulfur hydrogen oxygen image. Uh, hydrogen was used for luminance. Um, right out of the bat, it looked good. Uh, there was some magenta tinting that you see sometimes. Most times I used to remove it. I used to get rid of it. You can see a slightly in the dark nebulosity here, a little bit here, even on the stars. Uh, this starless image was obtained by taking the stack, stretching it, and uh, removing the stars. You can also remove the stars even in the linear form with star uh, exterminator from Russell uh, Cromon as well. Now, after I did that, I stretched the image, I did my s did my saturation adjustment, I started pulling on the image to see how much details I can get. After that, I used a uh, HDR multi-transfer on, on a luminous mask to kind of pull back some of the detail in the wall of Cygnus, which is what this is, the wall of Cygnus, or the North American Nebula. So I pulled that all out, and then I was happy with it. I decided to do some color mixing. So with color mixing, what I do is I take it to Photoshop, and I have a preset in my camera raw filter. Uh, soon enough, when I launch my Patreon channel, I'll make that available to everybody who will be a patron. And that does a number of things. It, it, it does some color mixing. It does some texture applications. It plays a little bit with the shadows, the um, highlights, and some of the blacks, removing them a little bit. And then after that, I have another proprietary uh, way of increasing a little bit of the dark, of the texture of the image. Now, I was pretty happy with the image. The details are there. You can even see a little bit of nebulosity coming off this wall of Cygnus. Um, I did think that it needed another HDR multi-transform to pull back some of this a little bit. And as I was processing this, I was talking to my friend Tudor, who was, uh, who was pretty amazing as well. He's astrophotography, YYZ or C. I'll put his Instagram link in the description. He's a very talented astrophotographer, and I was exchanging kind of versions with him. And I think I was, I was going to stop at this image, bring back the stars and leave it. But he said, you know what, I don't think it's good enough. Bring a bit more contrast and a bit more saturation to it. Um, so I did. Uh, and the detail, I really, really like the dark nebulosity, how it brushes off. Again, it looks almost like a painting, but it's an image. Now, I needed to do noise reduction and a couple of more steps, but this is definitely one of the best images I've taken of the North American Nebula. I've seen a lot of great images, but I'm really happy with mine. Even the detail in here to me is something I look at and really admire. So my final image, my final image is this. Now, I did a little bit more um, high dynamic range to pull back some of these details. I did a bit more uh, stretching on the S-curves, I did a bit more saturation. And you know what? It turned out a really good image. Um, I wasn't too convinced initially. I shared it with a couple of my friends, people who I trust in the astrophotography community. They've all said, hey, it's, it's really good. So I emailed uh, the two guys from NASA last night, and today they posted it as a notable image. Thank you, Jerry and Robert, for doing that. Uh, and I decided to share it with everybody. Um, Every single time you take one of these images, especially narrowband, narrowband is an art form, it's not necessarily scientific research. It's an interpretation of a deep space object using gases as your color palette. Gases are your crayons, basically. And it's not 100% accurate, it's not the point. The point is to show what nebulosity is there and the beauty of outer space, dust formations. If you want real images of space, image reflection nebulas like Orion or, I don't know, the Pleiades, 
they'll they'll be beautiful but again I do not I cannot do that here once once I'd be able to do it from a darker site I'll do some videos on that I wanna I'm curious to think what everybody thinks of this image um, posted it on Instagram uh, and I wanted to do a quick video showing this now I will actually process the left side of the image and do a mosaic the issue with mosaics is that once you have both the panels you want you have to align them somehow and it's not the easiest thing to do there are certain limitations you have to you have multiple ways of doing it you either stack channel by channel you either or you do you do the stacks the shos or whatever stack you want and then you kind of merge those I tend to use Photoshop for that. Uh, Pixinsight also has something in star alignment. But I was I've never been happy with it. I'm pretty sure that I don't know how to use it properly. Uh, I'll have to check a few more tutorials, but I am really happy with blending Photoshop and, and Pixinsight. Photoshop has been my tool of choice for a long time. Uh, so this is my North American Nebula. I'm excited to share it with everybody. If you have any questions or suggestions or feedback, just share it in the feedback section. Um, I'm working on my Patreon um, account to start it. Uh, it's almost done. Again, I'm going to probably give you guys uh, some free data to play with. Um, you're going to have access to my videos earlier. You're going to have uh, wallpapers to download. And probably the conversations will be a lot more, a lot more interactive there. Um, thank you. Happy New Year because the year has just started. It's just the 3rd of January for me. And um, I'll see you in my next video. I'm actually going to tackle another mosaic I did of another object. Uh, I'll try to do that video uh, in the coming days. But until then, um, thank you for watching my video and take care. Bye.